Stu, in all the years I've been thinking about science, doing scientific work, I've always sensed this, that there are principles that we can apply from physics and biology and chemistry. But here's what I've wondered. Are these things that, that the way things work, are they things that we impose on the world or are they fundamental ways that the world works at all different levels of the hierarchy of science? So I suspect that there really are general principles that apply across levels. But let me begin with a disclaimer. Steven Weinberg famously hopes for a final theory. Mm -hmm. And that final theory will entail by, by integration everything that happens in the universe. Um, I think that view is wrong. I don't think that there's any law that entails the becoming of the biosphere or life. And that's a huge change in our worldview since Newton. But there may be other general principles. It's just that they're not going to be the ones that Weinberg's looking for. So I'm going to give you an example that I have been most curious about over a number of years. And it applies in chemistry. Uh, it may apply in biology. It virtually certainly applies in economics. Mm. And there may be a way to find it applying in the abiotic universe. So here it is. It, 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 it's a teeny bit formal, but not very. Okay. So let me tell you, let me tell you about catalytic antibodies. You can make antibodies, and everybody knows what antibodies are, and you can make them so that you have a pot full of identical antibodies. They're called monoclonal antibodies. And it's known that you can search among antibodies and find an antibody that will catalyze a reaction. I won't tell you how, but it's really neat. Okay, I'm not going to make a two-dimensional coordinate system with my fingers in the air. On this axis, put the diversity of antibody molecules you're thinking about. One, ten, a hundred, a thousand, so logarithmic. Ten million, blah, 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 blah. On this axis, think about, put down the number of organic molecules you're going to put into a pot. Mm. Okay? So I've got candidate catalysts, and I've got a bunch of molecules that can undergo reaction. So let me be concrete for a second. Let's suppose that we're thinking about molecules that can undergo two substrate, two product reactions. So A and B get together and they make C and D. Mm -hmm. And let's just suppose, for, for ease of discussion, that every pair of molecules can undergo at least one two substrate, two product reaction. Well, you've got, let's say you've got N molecules in the pot. How many pairs of molecules do you have? Well, that's easy. It's N squared. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the number of reactions is N squared. Okay. Now, I'm going to make one assumption. Let's suppose that the probability that a given monoclonal antibody catalyzes a reaction is, say, one in a billion, 10 to the minus ninth. Okay? Now, suppose you put one monoclonal antibody in the pot with two randomly chosen organic molecules. The chance that it catalyzes the reaction is one in a billion, so nothing's going to happen. So we have this two-dimensional coordinate system. On this axis is the number of distinct kinds of monoclonal antibodies, namely identical antibodies. One, ten, 1, a hundred, a thousand, so that it's an exponential. And on this axis, the number of kinds of organic molecules. It's a theorem that there is a sort of hyperbolic curve in this space um, that separates what I'm going to call subcritical from supercritical. And let me give you an intuition for it. Suppose that the probability that an antibody molecule catalyzes a reaction is one in a billion. Take two organic molecules that can undergo one, two substrate, two product reaction, put them in a pot with that one monoclonal antibody. Well, nothing's going to happen. Right. It's 10 to the minus ninth. So a subcritical system has the property that it either makes no or only a few new kinds of molecules. But if you're above this curved line, there are so many reactions being catalyzed by so many molecules that you make new molecules, but they undergo new reactions that can be catalyzed by the same molecules. So you make still more new molecules. Mm. So the whole thing just explodes forever. It's like a nuclear bomb. It's critical well, mass. it may be what's right. going on in space chemistry where, uh, or the biosphere, where in space chemistry, people have found that chondronaceous meteorites like the Murchison meteorite have 
have at least 14,000 organic molecules, which is not what people think space chemistry is like, and they're one reaction step away from 100 million. I mean, what's going on out there? So you have supercriticality. How does it apply to different uh, uh, hierarchies? How does it apply? You explain how it's chemistry, biology. So let me tell you in economics, mm. where I know what I'm talking about. And the economists have ignored me for 25 <laughs> years. And I would like to hit them on the head, gently, but firmly. Mm. Okay. So um, it's the same thing, exactly the same idea. On the this axis, put down the number of production capacities that you have, like hammers and nails. And on this axis, put down the number of things that you've got in the economy that the production capacities might mm -hmm. work on, mm -hmm. like a couple of boards you want to nail together. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Two boards come together, get nailed, and they make two nailed boards. Mm -hmm. That's like a chemical reaction. And the production capacity is like catalyzing the reaction. It's the same idea. Okay, it's a theorem that there's a hyperbolic curve. It's the same curve in this space too. Below it, you're subcritical. It's a subcritical economy. Above it, you're supercritical. The economists ignore this. It's fundamental. So let's point to a supercritical economy. The U.S. economy and the global economy are making an increasing diversity of goods and services. In fact, We've grown from a thousand goods and services 50,000 years ago to billions now, and economics has no theory of it. I think it's because we are now supercritical. But let me tell you a subcritical economy. I lived in Alberta at the University of Calgary for five years. They make four things, beef, timber, oil, and wheat. They don't make anything else except the occasional hamburger. Okay, so they're not super critical, yet they have everything that the Washington consensus says that they need to grow. They have a superb infrastructure, highly educated people, stable money, a good banking system, uh, and a lot of money in the provincial coffers from the oil. They're not making new goods and services. Why not? Well, they're not super critical, that's why. Why does this matter in the economy? I believe, so, so, so this is my belief, it's not a proof yet. Uh, there's evidence that it's really true. Um, Ricardo Hausman has shown this at Harvard in the Kennedy School, that the richer the economy is in terms of good services and production functions, the more it grows and the richer it is. Um, we have failed to augment growth throughout the third world for 70 or 60 years with the IMF and the World Bank. They don't have these ideas, but we failed. Okay, so the ideas, either the ideas don't work or they're not trying. Okay, so let's look. You've now given me a data point in, um, in immunology and how mm -hmm. uh, the immune systems works with molecules, the catalytic systems. You've given me an analogy in economics. Now, you, that, that principle of supercriticality is working in both. Does it work in any other area? My suspicion is that the explosion and diversity of species is the same thing. So in the biosphere, it's, it's, I think it's, it's the, the same, same thing. thing. I think it's the same thing. So you we have in there. three areas, you have in, in, in uh, chemistry, in biochemistry, in the biosphere itself, in species, and in economics. So what is the implications for that in terms of general systems theory? Is this something, now you've been the pioneer of, of these ideas. Do you see that as something that you have uh, invented? and kind of imposed or something that you've discovered as something that really exists at the fundamental structure of reality. So we can take that as a principle of how the world works because it works in such diverse areas. I think that A, I discovered it, didn't invent it. I think it's extremely robust. It just takes the idea that you've got a bunch of things that can act on things and a bunch of things that can get acted on. And if you've got enough of them, that under a wide variety of assumptions about who acts on what, you'll get this. This is the same as my theory of the origin of life with the emergence of autocatalytic sets of proteins. It's, it's the same subcritical, supercritical transition. Um, this means two things. One is I think it's a discovery. I think that this is how the world works. Second, it's independent of the specific things that you put on the X and the Y axis. It's a consequence of number and chance, okay? for a wide distribution of how you say who acts on what, you'll get this phase transition. 
so I think that it applies to the origin of life. Um, notice that it's independent of the specific molecules, it's independent of the specific goods, it's independent of the specific species. It's made up of things that can operate on things to make new things, and things that can get operated upon to make new things, like new niches and so on, or new molecules. So it's very general, and therefore it's independent of our specific physics. If you were to change the constants of nature and could still make complex molecules that could react, you get the same thing. So it doesn't depend upon physics, the physics of our universe. It's an independent set of principles, and it's not entailed in the same way that Weinberg wants. It doesn't tell you what specific molecules get made. It says you will get this phase transition. So it's not reducible to physics. It's something new.